It is the Banner Baseball Show. Paul Mancano and Andy Casca here on a Monday, an Orioles off day, to discuss a weekend series up in Pittsburgh that Andy was present for. Andy, did you have a good time in the Steel City over the weekend, even though the Orioles did not play their best baseball? Oh, it was a great time. You know, you can never say no to a good Iron City uh, Iron City lager. For those who have never tried one. I've never uh, had one. It's it's like a natty bow, uh, except it's actually brewed locally. So ah oh, wow, shade yeah. thrown. Yeah, yeah. The, for people who don't know, uh, the manufacturing of natty bow has been moved out of state years ago, but it is back at Camden Yard, so you can still get that beer there. It's just not <laughs> a local beer anymore. Let's be honest about it. Yeah. Uh, is it? But is it a solid beer though? Iron City, it's called. Yeah, honestly, it's a fine. Yeah, it's a good. It's a beer drinker's <laughs> beer. Yeah, not nice. to completely dedicate this to, you know, my. No, we own. can go. Yeah, look, I have look, I have a count of like 700 beers at this point, and I've <laughs> Iron City rates favorably, but it's not near the top. But it's okay, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. I look, you know, that I like uh, any baseball themed beers, I've done a video on it in the past. I'm already gathering beers for my next video. This for, is on, uh, at all banner sports. By the way, if you are listening or watching along, please like, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the Baltimore banner. Dot com where you can read all of Andy's great work. Uh, one dollar for for six months, all there as well as at All Banner Sports at AF Casca. Like, review, rate, subscribe, all that good stuff. All right, Andy, let's talk about uh, the weekend series up in Pittsburgh because the sky was not falling in Pittsburgh, but based off the reaction from Orioles fans back in Baltimore, you would think it was. This Orioles team is five and four at this time, and and keen observers have pointed out that the Orioles at this point last year through nine games, we're also five and four. However, there are some reasons for concern and and it's understandable on some level because the Orioles offense has not been performing up to its standards. Brandon Hyde talked about it after the game yesterday. They have hit just 199 in the last six games with 170 batting average with runners in scoring position. Hat tip to Jacob Calvin Meyer for tweeting that out. And it's a lot of their top performers, not Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson per se, but it is the veterans who have been on this team for years, like Austin Hayes, Cedric Mullins, Ramon Arias, who are struggling at the plate right now. And it's frustrating to see, especially because there are no easy answers right now for this offense, Andy. Yeah, it's there's there's not really easy answers. And and part of the you know, we talked to Freddie Gonzalez, the bench coach, uh, on Sunday morning and He's been in baseball a long time, you know, as all of these guys have. But but he, you know, really preached like, hey, you know, he's seen uh, phenomenal starts where a player is hitting, you know, the laces off a ball, you know, to begin the season. And I, you know, he didn't say Jorge Mateo, but one of those players you think of is is last year Jorge Mateo began the year hitting like 350, and you know, the rest of the season kind of came back. Came, you know, came back to earth. And so it kind of goes both ways. Freddie Gonzalez was saying was that you have some guys that play unbelievably well in April and some guys who don't. And um, if you remember last year, Gunnar Henderson, you know, it was a slow start to the year. Uh, and then he, you know, turns it on in his rookie of the year and he had a phenomenal end of the season. Uh, not saying that, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's a different, uh, in terms of one was a 21 year old last year, and and some of these guys are more established veterans, so you expect them to be able to uh, produce at a more um, routine clip uh, to begin a year. But you mentioned it, Austin Hayes, um, Ramon Arias, are two of them, two, two of the main ones who are hitting below 100 right now, um, and especially because um, they face so many left left handed pitchers. You want your right-handers to be able to be in the lineup every day. Uh, otherwise, this is a left-handed heavy batting order. So you need people like Urias and and Austin Hayes to to really play at their best against left-handed pitching. Um, they haven't yet. And and now, if you think about it, uh, the O's have lost four of their five uh, games against the left-handed starter, which reminds you a lot of of what they saw late last year. Um, when the Texas Rangers rolled out uh, a couple lefties uh, struggled in the, in the postseason. Um, yep. That was part of the issue in the postseason was a lefty on the bump. And, you know, it's, it's nine games, you know, it's, it's going to be fine. You know, it's, it's, it's not a huge deal. The, the fact that Austin Hayes though, 
sub 100 batting average after nine games is probably going to be something, you know, come August that you're like, oh, he had a slow start, but he's really turned it on. You know, things like this happen all the time. And, and right. you know, I, I like to think that the sky is not falling. The, the sun will be uh, behind the moon in a minute, but that does not mean the season is over. <laughs> that is fair. I mean, if you were watching us instead of the eclipse right now, uh, true dedication as an Orioles fan. Uh, but let us be the sun uh, to remind you that uh, it, the sky is not, in fact, falling and the world is not ending. It's fun um, uh, saying that the banner is going to be the sun here. I don't know if we want to always go. With oh, that. true. That's a bad <laughs> reference to make. That is a bad reference to make. Yeah. Um, no, but yeah, you you are right to preach uh, patience, I think, Andy. Uh, the, the frustrating thing, like you said, Austin Hayes hitting 077 with just two hits and 26 at-bats right now, three walks. He does not have an extra base hit. Hayes has always been a streaky hitter uh, yeah. since the moment he came up five years ago. So that is to be expected. He's just going through an extreme slump right now. Mullins is hitting 143. He has two homers, uh, but he has not walked at all. Ramon Rios with just one hit in 18 plate appearances and one walk. Those are three guys in your lineup that you would be hoping that to, you know, produce a little bit more at this point, but you're not going to go away from those guys. You, you can't go away from those guys. Um, they have too much of a track record. They have done it for too long and been too key to this team's success over the last two years and beyond that you cannot go away from those guys. One guy that is, been very frustrating who is a veteran who has not been on this team though for many years he is a new addition to this team is tony kemp and i want to explain exactly why i'm getting brett phillips vibes from tony kemp because you were on that you were on the beat back in 2022 andy when the orioles traded for brett phillips from the tampa bay rays and i see a lot of similarities in the situation that tony kemp is in right now that brett phillips was in back then the Orioles picked up Tony Kemp right before the start of the season. He has coming off a very bad season the year before. Uh, he did not make the club out of spring training for the Cincinnati Reds, and he was on the, the market. At the time, Jackson Holiday had just been sent back down to AAA Norfolk after having a great spring and looking fully ready for the big leagues. And the pitch on Tony Kemp is, well, he's a great clubhouse guy. He can play multiple positions. You can use him in a lot of different situations. So far, four games in, seven plate appearances, he has yet to have a hit. Brett Phillips, when the Orioles acquired him after the trade deadline, right around the trade deadline in 2022, he was coming off a first half of the season, which he hit 147 in 75 games with Tampa Bay. And the pitch for Brett Phillips was, well, he can play multiple positions. He's a great clubhouse guy. And at the time the Orioles acquired him, there was a guy named Kyle Stowers who was mashing in AAA Norfolk, 17 home runs in the first half of the season, was hitting 260. And Brett Phillips proceeded to get two hits and 17 plate appearances for a 118 batting average. And two weeks later, got DFA'd as they brought up Kyle Stowers. Will we see the same thing happen with Tony Kemp and Jackson Holiday of Kemp being DFA'd to make room for Jackson Holiday in two weeks or a week's time? I don't know. But what I do know is that it feels like we are living Groundhog Day and it feels like the Orioles are again wasting their time a bit by kicking the tires on a veteran from outside the organization, believing that they can get some kind of depth from this guy when it's been shown that he doesn't have a whole lot left, unfortunately. we I like Tony Kemp a lot as a player when he was succeeding in Houston and we met him first week of the season. He was great to talk to and it seems like he has a lot of knowledge of this game that he can lend to the younger players. But I don't understand how Tony Kemp is on this team and Jackson holiday isn't right now, considering what Kemp has done in his, in, in last year, what he did in spring training for a different team and what he has done through the first two weeks of the season so far, Andy. I will take a reverse course and say, I know exactly why Tony Kemp is on this team instead of Jackson. Okay. Holiday. It's because you Tony Kemp is the 26th man and you don't have to worry about getting in plate appearances. That's you don't fair. have to worry about him being on the, in, on the field. And at this That's point fair. of the season, um, it, it's, it's fairly obvious that, you know, Michael, I said it, that they, they want to get Jackson holiday further at bats against left-handed pitching at a you know, high level in the minors. And I'll come back to that point in a second. Sure. Um, and, and then more time at second base, which, um, 
is, you know, a, you know, it's a position change that he looked great in spring training at second base. Um, but did have, you know, when I was down in Norfolk, he did have a throwing error that, you know, didn't, you know, didn't seem like it was, uh, you know, that much his fault. It was kind of a, it was a toss that maybe Errol Robinson could have gotten at second, but, um, you know, still, the is still an error. He's still figuring out second base a little bit. Um, that's the main reason you you want Jackson Holiday as he's going through um, this development period to play every every day and get a heck of a lot of time. And at, at the beginning of the season, because there were so many lefties that the Orioles were slated to, to face, um, you know, out of the out of the gate, that it probably felt like this wasn't the exact right time for Jackson Holiday. Um, Tony Kemp, meanwhile, uh, great clubhouse presence, can play multiple positions, and you don't have to play him very frequently at all. Um, sure. I completely understand the frustration factor when Tony Kemp comes up in a, in a, I think it was extra innings on Saturday, you know, or maybe it was the ninth inning Saturday, you know, it comes up and, you know, you're expecting, um, you know, help to come through to win a ball game and, you know, doesn't come through, uh, lays a bunt down, you know, a couple of nights ago. Um, I forget which night that was, but, um, you know, just, you know, doesn't come through. Um, I, I get the frustration because you because you see what's happening in AAA Norfolk, and you want that in Baltimore. Um, the one thing coming back to that left wanting more left-handed uh, pitching for Jackson to see. Sure. Um, one thing that I you know I, I have a trouble wrapping my head around completely with that idea is that if you're a high enough level left-hander you're going to be in the big leagues just because there's fewer lefties. You need lefties in the big leagues at all times. There's just not that many great lefties in the minor leagues, you know? And so he's not going to be facing that many um, really standout lefties. Um, his first at bat of the triple a season uh, was down there. No fork for it. Hits a home run <laughs> off a lefty. Um, mm -hmm. He hasn't struck out against the lefty so far. Um, this you know in triple a but he hasn't had that much hard contact against them either um except for that home run obviously um it, it's you know it's kind of an understandable concern you know concern though for the o's that hey if you're facing a bunch of lefties and if you don't believe he's going to be in the lineup every single time against a lefty let's you know have him get uh more more everyday at bats that's devil's advocate there um right. I, I do, but I, I do completely agree that it, it, it's difficult to look at, you know, Tony Kemp that is getting an opportunity when you'd want somebody else. And I actually think of, I actually, my mind goes almost more to Connor Norby. Um, the fact that he's a right-handed bat, plays second base, can play corner outfield. That's the exact profile of Tony Kemp, except he's a right-handed bat right. uh, instead of a left-handed bat. Um, Connor Norby has also begun, begun the season uh, tremendously well. And they all have <laughs> in Norfolk, it feels like. Yeah. yeah, they all have. Um, but you'd expect him to, you know, hopefully get a look at some point as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know when that when that look is. I mean, Jackson's probably the well, he is the the bigger, more hyped prospect, but uh, I I just look at it if it's the concern that well, we need somebody to play against lefties, and if you don't believe Jackson Holiday can immediately play against lefties. That's why my mind goes to Connor Norby and, and, and says, well, you know, the 23 year old uh, right. could be a platoon option who can play second base, can play left field, right field. And you feel pretty good about um, his offensive upside, even yeah. if his defense is, is major league average. Yeah. And John Mioli wrote a great piece for the Baltimore Banner this morning about that first week plus of the season for Norfolk and trying to put it all in context because it's been ridiculous. If you look at the offensive numbers, holiday hitting 342 through his first nine games with an OPS over a thousand Kobe Mayo hitting 390, another right-handed hitting infielder can't play second base more of a third baseman, but OPS over a thousand Norby, you mentioned hitting 395 with a 1.2 OPS and four homers in his first nine games and last but not least, Heston Kerstad hitting 462 with six homers in nine games down in Norfolk. And the only, yeah, oh, and Kyle Stowers, of course, uh, mashing as well. I don't have his numbers directly in front of me, but he's been doing great as well. Uh, yes. I mean, Mioli put it in good context 
by explaining the fact that, uh, look, Charlotte, the team that Norfolk was playing the last week, does not have a very good team, and they were shuffling arms back and forth. However, the numbers speak for themselves, and the fact that these guys are absolutely mashing AAA competition doesn't mean it can translate directly. And I understand the idea of Holiday wanting to get Holiday every day at bats because he is the top prospect on all of baseball and you want to develop him. I think there's also something to be said for having the 26 best guys on your team and whatever role Jackson holiday is going to have on this team, you make room for him and you see the struggles of some of the other guys on this team right now. Lefty righty doesn't matter a whole lot when Ramon Rios has one hit when, uh, you know, Austin Hayes, who is an outfielder, I know they don't play the same position is hitting 077, you know, so it, at a certain point, you have to take your 26 best guys and you have to put out a lineup that is going to be able to produce regardless of the platoon stats. And for Jackson Holiday, who had that homer, like you said, in the first game of the season off a of lefty, is, has three hits and a walk in eight plate, plate appearances against lefties so far this season, is getting more time at second base. You make room for the guy and you you shuffle whoever you need to shuffle around in order to make sure that Jackson holiday is getting those kind of at bats, because at this point, what they have right now offensively just has not been cutting it. But I, I understand what your, your point about, you know, they need to, they, they feel like they need to give Jackson holiday a little bit more time to marinate. Yeah. I mean, I don't disagree with anything you said, uh, just, <laughs> you know, from, from the, no, from yeah, the it's, side, I mean, that's, I and think that's, that's the organizational right. belief right now, clearly. Yeah. Um, it, it is ridiculous to see what everybody down in Norfolk is doing right now as well. Uh, the the problem that I have with some of the discourse online, though, when it comes to the Orioles right now and the failing offense is when players start when fans start to turn on guys like Austin Hayes and Cedric Mullins, who have proven themselves time in and time out based on a nine game sample size and say that Austin Hayes, who was an all-star a year ago, and Cedric Mullins, who was an all-star, what, three years ago, and plays gold glove caliber defense in center. Both guys who can play in center. Both guys who have proven themselves the last several years to be very productive, and yes, they'll go through occasional slumps, but they will usually pull themselves out of it. Will this those guys be on the team past their contracts in expiring at the end of 2025? Who's to say, but right now they are the best options available for this team. You can't just picture a, you know, come up with a fake trade on trade proposal, uh, dot com or ESPN's trade machine and try to come up with a way to get these guys out of town to make room for guys like Kyle Stowers or Heston Kerstad, because those guys are too good and too valuable to be DFA, obviously. And you can't just come up with a fake trade. If the trade's not there, Michael Elias can't force a trade to get these guys out of town. And frankly, Brandon Hyde and Michael Elias love what Cedric Mullins and Austin Hayes bring to a clubhouse and bring to a team. Yeah, I, I, I also, you know, what's going what's gonna to happen when inevitably Colton Kowser goes 0 for 10 during a stretch? I mean, right. this is just the, the this is the way that cookie crumbles sometimes in baseball and I feel like you see it so frequently on on social media, where it's the you know sky is falling, the the sun is being blocked by the moon. That uh, you know <laughs> that's true though. That's it, accurate. Yeah, you know, and that yeah, the latter heart half is accurate. But you know, it's it's you know as, at some point, you know, these young prospects are going to struggle a little bit. And I remember, you know, geez, when Gunner was going through it at the beginning of last year, I remember seeing people say like, ah, he's not ready. Send him back down to the minors. Right. And it's, you know, people love to jump to. Um, letter Z when you got to go through 25 other ones. Uh, I think there's 26 in the alphabet. Hopefully, we got that right. Um, but 26 players on the roster, 26 letters in the alphabet. Yeah, exactly. It works perfectly. Actually, that worked better than I was hoping it was going to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but but yes, I, I, I completely agree. Also, the defense from I know Austin Hayes lost the ball in the sun in Pittsburgh. You know, that happens. I mean, geez. You know, it's happened to me, you know, it, it, you know, just the way it is sometimes uh, ball gets in the sun and you lose it. But um, who's going to play center field if, if you magically got rid of Austin Hayes and Cedric Mullins? I mean, right. you have to, like, think these things through. And the, the outfield defense, uh, the defense in general has been phenomenal. Obviously, Dean Kramer threw away a ball. Um, the 
the wide throw from Gunnar Henderson to make a you know make a phenomenal play into the spectacular play uh, didn't work out yesterday in in Baltimore's favor. But overall, I mean, they're making dives. Cedric Mullins is plays a phenomenal center field. Um, Anthony Santander has taken you know the past couple of years has just been a phenomenal right fielder that I don't think it's enough plaudits for it. And definitely this year he's been at, at top of his game as well. These yeah. are guys that you don't just give these players away for nothing. They, they yeah. are worth, they're worth a lot. They're positive war players. Uh, there's probably 25 other teams out there that would snap your hand off for a waiver claim on Austin Hayes, Cedric Mullins. Uh, you know, that's just the way, that's the way this works. And so I'm really you know, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not surprised by, by seeing stuff, but um, I would, yeah, I just recommend to hold your horses for a minute and remember that um, these are proven players. Yeah. Um, and over the course of 162 games, a very large sample, uh, nine games um, is not indicative of, of what the 162 could look right. like. Um, yeah. It, of course, you know, of course it, it could, I mean, it, it could be a struggle. Uh, right. you know, for the rest of the year, but at, at a certain point, you can make that call, but not after nine games. Yeah, no, we're we're not saying they get, you know, a, a leash that goes on to infinity, yeah. but it the leash in fans' minds is far too short. Um, you know, oh, Paul, to, what, the, what do you think the leash is? Just I, I it's I've it's had, a good question, and I I've think it. I mean, if if we're looking at if Austin Hayes continues to get every day at bats, and it's may 15th and he's still hitting below 100 yeah i would press the panic button at that point um if he's hitting you know 210 and he's got his batting average back up and he's hitting for more extra base hits right now he's he has none mm -hmm. then you know you you press pause on the panic button because you are waiting for the guy to get out of it, it it's a great question and i think michael Elias and brandon Hyde are praying that they don't have to answer those kind of questions but you, you put it Oh, very well when you said who's going to play center field you know Heston Kerstad cannot play center field in the big leagues Colton Kowser can play a fine center field yeah. but Ryan McKenna is you know no longer on the off big the league 40. team yeah off the 40 man off the 40 man so he's down in triple a Norfolk and I know fans are probably not too eager to have him come back up Kyle Stowers hasn't played center field in a long long time so he can't play center and you have a massive massive left field at Camden Yards, which is basically like playing center field. Both That's those guys. Yeah, yes, is, is Hayes and Mullins can play agree. center. It's those two. And, and then when you have Kowser in the mix as well, the fact that he can play center, it translates really well to left field. I mean, Kowser exactly. plays a good left field because he can play center. Uh, yeah. He has the range for that. So it's not an it's not an easy thing. You have to really pay attention to um, that there's two sides of the two sides of uh, the coin. And, and one is, is what do they bring, you know, offensively and at a certain point there will be a time where you say okay you're hitting sub 100 and it's been a month and a, and a half and we're gonna have to make a change you know your yeah. back it is tight let's put you on the 15 day injury list you know you, you make you do something just to just to give him some time i mean right but this is not the time for that and no. plus it's really important to remember um you know like part of the reason this pitching staff has been as good as it has the past two years, inclu including the, including this year, then part of 2022 and, and then all of last year is because of the defense behind it. And um, there's a lot of ground ball pitchers uh, in the bullpen. Yenir Cano is a ground ball specialist. Uh, Dylan Tate with that sinker ball, ground balls. I mean, you need, you need a ground ball, you know, you need an infield that can, that can scoop up those grounders. And we've seen it with, with Gunner and Mateo and, and Arias at, at third base, you know, go go caliber. Uh, Jordan Westberg has looked great. Uh, you know, missed a real hot shot yesterday, but you know, it's, it was rule to base hit. It was it was correctly rule to base hit. Um, though, and Ryan Mountcastle can't forget about him at first. Um, yeah, and then the outfield. Great. I mean, just think of how many how many uh, just this year. You know, the nine games it can pick out uh, like four or five full out running plays in the gap or diving catches from outfielders that have saved. Hits, if not runs. Yes. So. Yeah. And uh, I, I think two, interestingly, two guys who also play great defense, who for whom the leash is a little bit shorter than it is for Hayes and Mullins, is Jorge Mateo and Ramon Arias. Now, Jorge Mateo, by the way, is starting out the season great offensively, mm -hmm. just as he did last year. He's hitting 300 to start the season. 
Ramon Arias is starting out about as slow as anyone in baseball. One hit in those 18 plate appearances, just one walk. He is really going through it right now. Both those guys don't have nearly the same track record that Hayes and Mullins do. And especially when they're playing in the infield, their defense has to be premium, but they also got to, they have to stave off Jackson Holiday coming up, Kobe Mayo and Connor Norby, three guys who appear to be ready for the big leagues right now. Yeah. Those guys are closer to DFA, you know, uh, consideration. However, Ramon Arias won a gold glove two years ago, still plays great defense at third base. They're expecting him and hoping that he is going to get out of this right now, get out of this slump. And Jorge Mateo brings something defensively in terms of speed or something on the base paths, his speed that right now, very few players do on this team. You know, Cedric Mullen still has blistering speed. Gunnar Henderson is still a very good runner uh, between, you know, in on the base paths. However, Ryan McKenna is back down in triple A. And we saw the Orioles play the long game with Jorge Mateo and hold him all the way through the season in order to make sure that he played on their October roster, their ALDS roster, and was available as a pinch runner or pinch hitter at times. But these two guys are, are yes, they're positive war players. Yes, they're good defenders. I do think the leash is a little bit shorter when it comes to Ramon Arias and Jorge Mateo. I don't know how long that leash is, but I think they face a tougher situation right now than Hayes and Mullins. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think um, with Mateo's defensive versatility and the way he's starting offensively, um, I, I'm not... I don't think right, you can't was, do anything with yeah, that. Yeah. You're, you're, he's, he's doing great. You know, just you know, put him to the side for a second, but Ramon Arias, um, definitely a tough start for him. And the fact that the positions he plays, um, you have basically a like for like change in the minors with three guys. Um, you know, Kobe can play third. Ramon plays third. Kobe's defense has taken, you know, taken steps forward. That was maybe the major, um the the major uh hindrance on, on why he wouldn't be a major league ready prospect you know immediately um he has improved although i think the game i was there uh had two errors but you know that was just because i was there it was a little nervous about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um then you know you had uh you know jackson holiday you can play second and short and connor norby plays second and in corner outfield. so you have those three guys that are all ready to make the jump and at a certain point, if if this team does need to shake it up um, and, and inject some new life, I would expect him to be or Tony Kemp, um, maybe maybe yeah. even more Tony Tony Kemp over Ramon, just because Ramon I still think has a lot of value. So is in his career, you're you're talking about a 250 some career hitter, um, not too much power, but good defense in multiple positions. Can play first base as well. Um, right. that's a, that's a hard thing to come by. You don't say, you know, you don't usually give up a player like that for nothing, um, which yeah. is something the Orioles definitely do not want to do when, when Mike Elias has made, um, made this roster really by working on the margins yes. and, and maximizing, um, maximizing the opportunities they have, um, with, in, in regards of, of not adding payroll. Um, you know, say, hey, let's get this guy on waivers because we see something that we could we could fix. You know, th those things have made have really made this this roster. You know, obviously the draft picks are, are are big, but if you look at a lot of these contributors, Anthony Santander, well, that was Dan Duquette, but Anthony Santander, rule five, rule five, draft, yeah. You know, and and you know, Ryan O'Hearn, you know, a cheap pickup, you know, Danny Coulomb, you know, players of that ilk that that are really centerpieces of of what makes this team go. So they don't necessarily want to give up a guy like Ramon Arias. Um, at a certain point, of course, you're going to have to make a call. You're going to have yeah. to decide one way or another. Um, you know, maybe it's even just a cash consideration trade where you say, you know, maybe it can help out with some of the contract, um, you know, the, the paying off the contract. But whatever it is, uh, it's not going to be an easy decision. I really don't envy uh, the position they're in because they broke camp trusting this roster. Um, and knowing that they had the potential to, you know, if there was an injury or a slump that you had the, um, you know, the, the reinforcements in AAA, but you don't ever want to be forced into, 
you you know making a hard decision and, and saying bye to a player that has helped your club get to this point you know yeah. ramon played a big part last year played a big part in 2022 um yeah, yeah. It, it would be tough to get rid of him it would be a total reversal too and because those are two guys that remember the orioles picked both those guys up off waivers they mm -hmm. picked up ramon rias off waivers from the Cardinals. they picked up Jorge from the padres i believe so for them to just end up back on waivers after everything that they contributed to the team and then watch two teams who are not in the playoff race, pick up both those guys and turn them into, you know, back into the, the guys that we saw in, in 2022 and 2023 from those guys, it would just, it's a funny situation because we've seen the Orioles expectations change. And as such, we've seen playing time doled out differently and we've seen the leashes shortened. Yeah, I, I would also say just, you know, contradicting everything I just said, um, <laughs> you know, which is I, I like to play it down the middle. So this is now I'm playing the reversal of what I just did. But uh, this is a team that is in win now mode. Right. You know, you just won 101 games. Uh, the pressure's on to repeat in the AL East. Uh, they they want to go back to the playoffs and, and go further this this October. Um, that win now comes with tough decisions. And yeah. Some of that is you're going to have to decide um, who doesn't make the cut. And, you know, one of those things we saw with Ryan McKenna not making the team, that was a that was a really hard decision because uh, the clubhouse presence that he brought, Brandon Hyde definitely valued um, McKenna's uh, makeup and his ability to be a base runner and uh, defensive replacement late in games. Uh, really valued that. And... Yeah. But they made the decision that they, they figured that, hey, in win now mode, a, you know, prospect in Colton Kowser is going to give us a, a larger upside at the plate, uh, if not necessarily on, on the bases. Um, although he's a fine base runner, I don't mean to take anything away. But, you know, just um, that was a decision made with, with winning now in mind. And at a certain yeah. point, uh, the Orioles are going to need to uh, make the decision of, Ramon Arias, you've given us a lot, or whoever it is. I'm just using him as, as an example. Yeah. Um, you know, you've given us a lot, but we have so and so in the minors that we think can give us more at this at this point. That's yeah. part of the tough decisions, and and uh, they're going to have to do it sooner rather than later. Um, and, and what I mean, probably like in a month. Um, you have this, you know, you April. I think you kind of ride and, and see how it goes, and you know, I, I think they can. They can call up prospects for the first time, I believe, in after 15 days after opening day. So we're coming up on that. Um, I forget the the date, Paul, if you remember. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, yeah. Fans can fact check us on that, on that one. But they can call up prospects pretty soon now. Um, you know, there's a little bit of, of where you can only do injury replacements for the very beginning of the season. Uh, but then you can make more promotions. Um, when that when that time comes, I mean, we'll, we'll see how aggressive the roster construction is. Yeah. Uh, you know, this off season, Michael, I said multiple times that this is an aggressive, you know, the, the, the market is going to be, uh, it, well, the, 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 the mentality is going to shift, uh, into a more aggressive, um, mindset. They went and traded for Corbin Burns when they hadn't done that, obviously for, you know, they haven't gotten rid of prospects in a buy side trade such as that before, well, you know, Jack Flaherty last year, but this was a, major prospect load you got rid of in Joey Ortiz and Dio Hall, who will be coming to Kevin Yards as members of the Brewers at the end of this week. Good for them. Um, they, you know, that was a major uh, statement saying, hey, we're going for it. Uh, the next major statement would have been, you know, Jackson Holiday on the opening day roster. Uh, they, they weren't exactly ready there because they didn't think Jackson Holiday was ready for it. Um, then, you know, now we're going to look at the next statement is, how aggressive are they going to be in making midseason promotions or even even trades of, of major yeah. league players out um, or in, you know, whatever direction it goes? Um, that's the next big question. Yeah. And we'll see if we get any answers uh, over the coming week. Uh, the Orioles are still on the road, uh, by the way. They begin a three game series against division rival Boston Red Sox for the Red Sox home opener, which feels way too late in the season to be doing a home opener. But Red Sox are coming home tomorrow. For the, so that's like a two o'clock game. And then, like you mentioned, Andy, at the end of the week, they come back home 
to face the Brewers and DL Hall and Joey Ortiz and Corbin Burns potentially facing his uh, his old opponent. Although I don't know if the the starts will line up quite like that uh, for Corbin uh, Burns. Burns pitches, Burns pitches Tuesday, uh, okay. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah, he'll pitch Saturday, I guess. Um, so yeah, he'll face the Brewers. Yeah, yeah, uh, or Sunday. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah um, so what we we shall hopefully get some uh, some more answers over the coming week. But like you said, Andy, it's it's going to be it, it's going to need a longer sample size. And these guys are going to need longer leashes than nine games. And they might need longer leashes than 15 games by the time we're talking next. So um, we may not have definitive answers on these guys and we may still have be having this same conversation. But what I would do is preach patience to Orioles fans who are ready to jump ship for a team that has a winning record and is just nine games <laughs> into the season. It's all, all way too early at this point. Um, but Andy, uh, one more thing that we should touch on real quickly. John Means made another rehab start down in AAA Norfolk. Went a whole lot better than his last one. Uh, three innings, one run on just one hit, four strikeouts and one walk. Uh, he is slowly being built back up. And that's another decision the Orioles will have to make when he is ready to go, who they end up bumping out of the rotation and how they end up uh, reshuffling their pitching uh, staff. When do you think he will be ready to go? And do you think his timeline has changed at all? Um, I don't think it's changed at all, actually. I, I think he's still in line. Um, Brandon Hyde, you know, when 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 John Means started uh, his rehab um, assignment with the Norfolk Tides, Brandon Hyde said that uh, it would probably be the 30, 30 days or, or close to it. So it would be about a month. So I'd imagine by the end of this month, uh, two more starts in him. Um, you know, he, the fact that he got to three innings is is a good step. Uh, maybe next time he can go to four or five, um, you know, and maybe a final rehab start to five or six. Uh, that That's a pretty good base. If he can get up to 70 to 80 pitches with the ability to go maybe a little bit longer, um, he'd be at a good space to, to come back uh, for Baltimore. Um, obviously, it's, it'll be interesting to see just how the, just how he looks uh, in the next coming games, because the first rehab start was basically his first spring training start. If you want to just equate the two, right. uh, seven runs or whatever against him. I forget the exact number. Um, yeah. Seven runs in one inning, I think. Yeah. And that that's, you know, I don't need to tell you that's not, it's not great. Um, this one was a lot better, but again, it was against the Charlotte Knights team. That is a triple A affiliate of the Chicago White Sox and the White Sox uh, don't exactly have a great major league roster and don't exactly have a great triple a roster so uh take take with you know take from that what you will um uh, but we'll see you know as as the next couple starts uh you know are ongoing um john is is obviously another guy that's done so much for this organization and has the potential to be a, a big piece of this of this rotation um yeah maybe maybe it's a like for like change where Cole Irvin is moved into more of a bullpen role. I honestly was surprised that I kind of thought Cole Irvin might be used out of the bullpen in Pittsburgh because you had these off days. So you can hmm. move Corbin Burns up to Tuesday, which they did. But then they had right. Corbin pitching um, Wednesday instead of Grayson Wednesday. And Grayson pitched Friday. So yeah, he could have. I mean, Grayson could have gone Wednesday. Right. Um, I mean, it's but the. Better. Yeah, but the the off days on either side of this Pittsburgh series could have at least allowed some room. And the way that Cole Irvin struggled in his first start uh, with the Orioles, you know, could have allowed them to maybe make that that transition smoothly. I like how you're thinking, Andy. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> well, I'm you will have my dad was yeah. yeah. Uh, so you have uh, complete coverage, and and Danielle as well, and John Mioli are all writing great stuff. Uh, for the Baltimore Banner.com, or you can subscribe one dollar for six months. Andy, thanks so much for hopping on at AF Casca to follow him on Twitter, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Has the uh, sun disappeared yet? Yeah, that's a great know. question. I have not looked out the window, I have my glasses around here somewhere, so I'm about to stop outside and give it a look. Sounds great. <laughs> All right, thanks so much for tuning in to the Banner Baseball Show, 